flow again. Uh, for those online, you may have noticed there's been a very slight change in that I moved here. Um, <laughs> Magic. I, I'm here to call to order the uh, first financial affairs committee meeting of the school year, um, Tuesday, August 6th. My name is Dan Schultz. And we will begin with a roll call, starting with Ms. Lovely. Here. Zachary Epps, present. Charles Bordell Williams, present. Liam Mulhern, present. Mia Blitzstein, present. Dan Schultz, present. Uh, next item is approval of minutes. So moved. Mr. Bordell Williams, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the next uh, next is the agenda items, Mr. Spiker. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. All right, it's time on the agenda. We will take a look at the interim financial statements through July. Um, spoiler alert, they aren't that, uh, they aren't that informative. There's only one month, back, one month of uh, financial activity. Um, we'll, we'll cover that briefly. Uh, we'll take a look at the state budget that was approved, um, I believe, nine days after the deadline for the district budget to be approved, which uh, is incredibly inconvenient from my position trying to determine what the finances are for next year. Um, but we'll discuss some of those differences. Um, we'll take a look at the strategic plan. Uh, we received the final recommendation report from KCPA about how to proceed moving forward. And then last, we'll take a look at our SO3 spending um, as that comes to close. All right, so get my technology in order. So look at revenues over expenditures year over year from July 31st to the month ending July 31st. Uh, there's a couple items to point out. One is our local revenue, which is primarily our real estate tax revenue. Because of the late date, in which we adopted the budget, um, as we were waiting for the state to adopt their budget, uh, cash flows are, are slightly behind prior year because the bills were not mailed at the same time. Um, so nothing alarming by the change in collections, just simply a cash flow time issue. Um, state and federal sources, those monies come in, they, they're applied to receiving bolus. These will end up being adjusted as we um, close out the year for the audits. You'll see that match prior year in a very short order. Um, looking on the expenditure side, at this point last year, we had incurred um, $2.2 million of expenditures. This year, we have incurred $2.7 million of expenditures. Uh, that's two simple two simple reasons. One is we purchased uh, curriculum and textbooks for um, English, and that was done in July. So we said purchased last year, and we paid our insurance bill quicker than we did last year, which I'm sure we're quite happy to receive early, but maybe by a couple of days. So it's all based on the month. Um, so not much to not much to show here. Um, we have just one month set to begin. Uh, any questions on the interim financials? Uh, it's really a matter of accounting and dates, right? Like that revenue was so realized with the end of year 2023. But these are current year collections. I mean, that's the, the variance between used, it was the timing of our budget. So we still collected revenue, which is being applied to a different time period. Right? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the stuff coming in from last year. It's just all a matter of dates and account. The budget was approved so late. This is the cash flow. You'll see that consistency throughout the suit. But we necessarily won't catch up. It'll just be a thing that we monitor. So we are variance will start probably still be there. We're, we're audited once a year. So what we do is we we're audited it's mid date is June 30th. So we'll audit our books to, to be accurate on June 30th. And, and then the rest of the, all of this interim accounting will just be a purely cash basis to do a full full adjustment every month to require our my department and it really does Juice isn't worth the squeeze in terms of that. So, um, yeah. And so, and then in, we'll, you'll probably come back and we'll see a variance in a future report, but that's nothing to be 
worried about because it's all going to come back. Like throughout the year, there's still going to be that variance there. There's nothing to be worried about because it's all inside. There are no other questions that we want to be uh, the state budget update questions for the public. You put it's a small detail. Okay. Um, so as mentioned, after the after the end of the year and subsequent to the passing of the school district's budget, we received a fully passed budget up in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And um, there were some significant changes this year versus prior years in terms of the way the state decided to fund school districts. Uh, originally, it was anticipated that a lot of the additional funding from the school districts would be through the basic ed, basic ed funding commission equity in school districts. We would see it through our standard basic ed subsidy, which um, for last year's budget was $6.8 million through the show. So, if the expectation was a lot of the money we received to help with this particular subsidy. Uh, what happened was in the period of less than a week, um, a very short period of time, a lot of decisions were made at the state level and a lot of different funding sources uh, came into the district in different forms. Um, one of these is a charter school reimbursement. So that's a reimbursement for our cyber school charter expense. It's based on enrollment. It was estimated by the state to be $289,000 for this year, something that had not existed in the past. Um, the special education subsidy remained. Um, the formula for how it was calculated was adjusted based on uh, level of need of a special ed student. The property tax relief was already announced that so that was going to be increased and that was already um, certified by the state back in uh, May, I believe. So that was already accounted for. Our school mental health and security grant essentially remained the same as it was planned on being funded. And the biggest piece was um, ready, the Ready to Learn block grant was expanded by $1.1 million. And that was a brand new funding source as well. So when we look at what we budgeted in these categories for the state, we budgeted 15.4 million. When we look at what this, the ending state budget ended up being, it was $17 million. So a difference of $1.6 million coming in from the state versus what we budgeted. And this really represents a, a, a historic increase from year to year. Um, last year, the state budget was 14.5 million. This year it was $17 million. Um, in my entire career and in my auditing career, I've never seen such significant increases. So, of course, this is um, this is great for Shell. And this this ready to learn block grant is almost specifically targeted toward well, it is specifically targeted toward Shell yeah, in our current um, assessment. <clears throat> also new in the state budget is cyber charter funding reform. So we currently pay our cyber school tuition, I'll simplify this, by taking our special education expense and dividing it by 16% um, of our assessment. The 16, I'm, I'm sorry, of our enrollment. 16% is a state number. It's not reflective of what our actual special ed enrollment is. As you can imagine, it inflates what our tuition is. So special ed divided by 16% of our students creates a large tuition expense. Now we're going to use with the actual percentage of special ed students we have. Um, so we're going to take our total special education expense and divide it by 21%, which is a much larger number, which creates much smaller tuition, and extrapolating that out um, amongst all the cyber charters is, is you know, we'll reduce our cyber charter expense by approximately $50,000 expected next year. So that's on top of everything on the, on the prior page. So that was a step in the in the right direction. Um, for those of you really curious, um, the Department of Education posts all the fund balances of every district cyber charter on its website, and you can see there's still some extraordinarily large fund balances in our cyber charter schools. So this doesn't quite do anything to address um, that issue, but um, it certainly helps with quality of funding moving forward. Um, the next change from the state budget, as mentioned on the prior page, was the Ready to Learn block grant. So, the school district received a tax equity adjustment as part of its Ready to Learn block grant, and it has specific purposes in which it must be used. Um, the 
the overarching purpose is mitigating and preventing preventing increases in knowledge grids, which is essentially where this money is planned to be spent. Uh, we're also looking at other options in terms of um, supplementing or creating a senior tax rebate uh, or uh, mitigating or replacing lost revenue. Um, and we're not really looking at reducing debt as debt structure is, is difficult to change. Uh, but you know, the primary purpose, mitigating and preventing you know, real estate tax increases is where this money is, is geared for. Um, the next piece was the PCCD Pennsylvania uh, Commission on Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Um, again, issued their school security and mental health grant. This year it's combined into one grant. It used to be two pieces. One piece was for school mental health, and that was for um, support for students, but primarily in the form of counselors. Uh, the other piece was security related for you know, physical security items. This year's combined into one grant, one patient. Um, and the last piece was a public school facility improvement grant. If you recall, when the budget was approved this past year, which was in December, um, it took roughly five months for the, the state to come up with a, a process and a procedure in which we could apply for the public school facility improvement grant. And um, as Tim as Tim and I discussed in the spring, uh, when the application was available, we applied for um, improvements to the high school roof to replace some of the the oldest parts of the roof to help carry that building through the end of its life. So um, October is the date when that grant is supposed to be announced, with, um, who receives what um, and the timeline for spending it. And we will wait to see when the guidelines come out for this grant. Um, this grant was combined with the environmental grant, so there are going to be some different regulations and I'm sure a different application process for how this is. What was not in the state budget. So the past scholarships, the scholarships for those uh, wanting to change their public school setting, that was not part of the budget. That was a heavy piece of, of negotiation throughout the process. Uh, there was a push for cyber charter, cyber charter tuition rates to be a flat rate across all districts. That did not make it in the budget. You saw there was a negotiated um, formula change and a full $871 million basic good funding commission recommendation was not approved. That money came out in different forms. We got, as part of that money, we got a tax equity adjustment. We probably made out better than some other districts in that regard, um, but we didn't quite get that full increase. The, the level of increase we got probably represents more of a, a $250 million increase to the to the basic ed subsidy rather than an $871 million increase. Um, so any questions on the state budget? Can you remind me the property tax relief, the 4.6 million? Is that the homestead? That's the, the casino money, the homestead. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's what's next. <laughs> um, first, thank you to uh, fellow board members within listening ear, even without. We had some advocacy around the uh, past scholarships. So uh, for what it's worth, right? Everybody contributes to it. So we definitely did our part uh, in ensuring that, at least for now, our public dollars are focused on public schools. Uh, so I was happy to see that, that in the past. Um, the tax equity, the ready to learn block grant, uh, does that go to the general fund or does it go somewhere else? Well, where does that, where do those funds actually go? So the current ready, ready to learn block grant is um, the current purpose is to reduce class size or provide kindergarten or reading supports. Every year we apply for that grant. That is essentially the funding for our kindergarten aides and our school buildings. That's what that is allotted for. So there'll be a new application process. We'll have to um, apply for this tax equity adjustment, and demonstrate how we're going to spend it to um, reduce taxes, reduce taxes going forward. That's the part I don't, that's the part where it's like tricky because it's in the ready to learn, but we have to use it for tech. So that's probably like, just go to the general fund or did, are we actually using it to purchase like. Um, we we'll have to I, I just, without, without even receiving what the grant okay, application looks okay. like, I can't quite answer that question. Yeah. Um, you know, once that. I just so thought it was odd. More that clarity it was, not odd. I thought it was, I guess, ambiguous that it was in the ready to learn. I guess that's I maybe some political shenanigans. I think it's, a, it's, it's optics. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah, I'm just trying to draw the link from it's tax equity, but then how it's, we've already raised taxes for this right. year. And so you have to apply for it. And you have to apply for it. So it's just it's very, um, it's just something that we're, I guess we're still looking to. Once the application is process yeah. review, I can share more information. Yeah. Yeah. It's a brand new piece of legislation. No, that's good. And that, that answers my next one. So it's an annual application. And I guess that tax equity will be assessed based on like every year where we are. And, like how did, so they originally you know, they originally discussed it being seven year payment, but the budget you can't prove a seven year budget. So right. I, I think every year is just going to be part of the negotiation and it's going to be up in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think some of that money could end up back in basic education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean I don't yeah. Know why. Yeah. it would have made a lot of sense because the, you know, the state did a lot of work trying to change the funding formula and make it right before we turn around. Right. Yeah, so I'm just trying to connect. And maybe there's some uh, questions on the legislative committee side. We can do some you know, pairing up. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other board questions? Um, I had one, I, one question, and then your question is maybe like the ready to learn block grants. I'm going to have to spend some time wrapping my head around what this means, the timing, and the fact that it's applied makes it feel less recurring revenue then you would want to lower your millage. So I, I'm just, it'll take some time to fully grasp. The regular block grant has been around for a long time. Sure. And the funding has not changed for a very long time. Okay. Um, at all. So I don't know that, I don't know if that helps you. <laughs> right. <laughs> I really so hopefully, so we'll find out more, but hopefully it does mean this is a, will be a recurring thing that we have to apply for, but it's relatively reliable over time. But I, Sorry, I shouldn't have even said that because you already said we'll learn more when the application process is revealed. And I'm sure we'll I, I think it's going to have to be renegotiated state by state. I think that's the best, that's the best we can say. About uh, but the bottom line, and this is I think relevant for the public, is we've already passed our millage for this year. That millage isn't changing this year. This would be a, by the time we understand what this means in terms of it would be relevant for next year's budget, and so savings would be reflected in next year's budget conversation. Um, I had a question around, and I think I know the answer, but I don't want to assume. There was $100,000 for the school mental health and security grant, I, or it's 150, so never mind. So I also heard something about $100,000 around cell phone stuff from a, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. part of this budget update, or is that a totally separate? That is totally budget? separate. It's only if the district opts to apply. Okay. So this this one hundred fifty is just so what the state budget came out with was you're going to get one hundred thousand dollars per district, and then the rest is going to be based upon enrollment. But they haven't released for that amount, so I don't I don't know what that that is yet. So um, I'm just estimating it's one hundred fifty because that's what it's been the past couple of years. That makes sense. All right. I'll revisit the other other item elsewhere other time. Thank you. That's my questions. Any questions for the public? Yes. Um, it's, and I think it's it's for. Um, and uh, if you could just introduce where your name and where you live for the record. Hi. Don't worry. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dana Burnley, and I am in the I guess East Sheltonham area, um, between Melrose Country Club and. Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> question, question um, regarding the whole finance organization. Is it just you or do you have people that are on your staff exclusively? I have a whole department. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. <laughs> all right, thank you. And I, I uh, don't see hands on Zoom, but great. I think we're good. Thanks, Mr. Swire. All right, moving on. So um, just after we had our last legislative meeting, KCBA released their, what we've been calling the feasibility study for the past 18 months. They released the report calling it the Long Range Facilities Planning Study, which is a culmination of all of the work and all the efforts that's been put in put in in the past 18 months into one, one recommendation 
um, one you know dozen page document giving the district guidance moving forward. And the guidance is regarding what to do with the district's largest long term capital assets, namely its, um, its buildings, its facilities, um, with a focus on those, those facilities that are the oldest. So the roadmap that we have talked about moving forward was um, Elkins Park replacement, high school infrastructure upgrades, aka high school air conditioning. Um, at some point, the replacement of the district administrative building, and at some point, the replacement of the high school athletic complex. As part of that plan, if you recall, KCBA gave us three pathways to consider. One was to take the existing district structure and, and keep it the same, uh, to renovate Elkins Park, to make it a brand new school, um, continue down the path of, of replacing the schools one by one. The second was to close Elkins Park, to expand Cedarbrook, to make it a six to eight school, to move fifth grade back into elementary schools, and to create the space to move all fifth grade back into each respective elementary school. Uh, by adding addition to Glenside, which is our only elementary school that currently can't fit a uh, K to five model. And the final option was to close Elkins Park to expand Cedarbrook to a six to eight school and to build a new early learning center uh, for kindergarten and first grade. And that kind of helped address that uh, capacity for fifth grade at the elementary school level. And all three of these pathways came with a different price tag. Pathway number one, um, for a brand new uh, Elkins Park, which was the most expensive piece of path pathway number one, at an estimated price tag of $121 million. Pathway number two had a total investment of approximately $5 million. And pathway number three had an estimated price tag of $113 million. So the recommendation from their report is to choose pathway number two. And again, these are not official. Uh, these are not official architectural drawings. These are pure concepts uh, based on space on the site uh, as to where what a potential addition at Glenside would look like, what a potential addition at Cedarbrook would look like, and whether there's enough space in those lots to even make it a possibility. So, as described, pathway number two: targeted addition at Cedarbrook, targeted addition at Glenside, so that it had the capacity to add fifth grade within that specific school building. Fifth grade would go to, to all their respective elementary schools as part of this plan. Before waiting to move up to sixth grade to go to Cedarbrook, to add HVAC to all the classroom spaces at the high school and to upgrade and renovate the stadium. And the estimated price tag for each of these projects is attached in this slide, um, culminating in that $75.1 million um, price tag. In addition to the to the estimated cost and the um, assessment of our facilities, um, I assisted them in providing a proposed funding strategy uh, for what will be the best option for the district moving forward, given our um, our two most obvious constraints, one being our tax rate, um, our tax rate having in our tax base having very little capacity for tax increases to fund these projects going forward. The second being our our debt service and our debt capacity, our debt capacity being near, um, not near maxed out, but not having the debt capacity for a large um, Elkins Park project in addition to a large high school project. Um, as our high school has, uh, even though has had significant renovation throughout the years, the core of it is still a 1955 uh, construction building. And I think that strategy, or, or I'm sorry, that debt, um, issue and that debt conundrum we have is best represented by our annual debt service um, chart. So across the bottom, for those of you who can't see it, as of January 1st, 2023, this is our debt service payment. Our debt service for our existing school projects is locked in at approximately $10.6 million until 2041, when all of our debt for all of our existing schools will be paid off. It's at this point where we would need to build in um, a new project um, currently, our debt capacity is would be enough to cover one high school project. So, what we're looking at fitting in this in this gap would be that high school project. So, um, by undertaking a much larger facilities plan moving forward, we would have to increase our existing debt service structure to to beyond uh, levels in which 
any other school district in the state has debt service. Um, so currently our debt service is eight and a half percent of our entire expenditures. The max level it is in the state is 12% of our expenditures. Um, you know, doing a full renovation of Elkins Park would put our debt service well above that 12% to make and put our district well out of out of an acceptable ratio for debt service for a school district. So that was our limitation on the debt side. We're, we're trying to preserve this debt service space for 2042 uh, when we need a high school replacement. So we're trying to get our high school through 15 years. We're trying to get our high school through, sorry, um, 14 years when we could look at restructuring our debt um, and pushing those debt payments out. So we're trying to, we're just trying to, to build that gap. So that's the essence of the um, future funding strategy. It is to use assets in our general fund, to use assets, existing assets in our reserve fund to help pay for these projects, to limit our future debt as much as possible. In this case, $37 million of additional debt, which is significantly less than the other options. Um, and still keep flexibility for the district to have debt capacity to move forward with the license. Uh, any questions on the, the strategic plan report? Any board questions? Mr. Verdella? Uh, more of a comment. Uh, there may be a question, but a comment first. Um, just in terms of where we are currently in the district, I'm encouraged by the fact that you know there is still focused attention on staying within some relative amount of tax increase that will be acceptable, recognizing that we do have some rather large uh, negotiations happening, right? That you know, this is a small portion of our budget but that we with that have a relatively small amount of flexibility there as well um as well as the debt obligations i know what we've done over the last couple of years has been to take action as a board to kind of i guess i would call the refinance i don't know if that's necessarily the right term but to put us in a position where we are not so heavily debt obligated and that's gotten us here which has been um, really great so that's the, the first comment that i have um Second, also, um, just you know, as we are at this point in this planning process, uh, you know, the one question that I have is, you know, what what do we need to to do next? I know that there are um, some decisions clearly that we have to make, and likely some voting, et cetera. And so, I'm just curious about the the overall timeline. So, um, as you know, the stadium project is already started. That was. That's one of the smaller pieces of this capital, future capital plan. And it was one of the, um, of all of our facilities, it's one of the easiest things to make a decision on how to replace it. Um, Elkins Park wasn't as clear because um, you know, we had to we had to first assess our ability, are our current facilities big enough to house, house the students we have? Um, where would we need more space? What's the best grade configuration? Or what's the best building configuration? Um, how do we make this change without having to disrupt parents and students who live in their neighborhood schools trying to find that solution so there was just as minimal disruption as possible uh, and the same with the hvc in high school so we have a building that's um, you know as, as mentioned earlier the core is from 1955 and a full-blown hvac upgrade to that building by two different two independent estimates um, the estimate was 50 million dollars so Investing fifty million dollars into a building that would cost two hundred million to replace, that's seven years old, um, doesn't seem like a wise investment. So, trying to find an alternative solution, how do we address HVAC in our classroom spaces? Um, coming up with strategies for that took some time to develop. Um, so, going forward, the stadium project is underway. Um, looking at what to do next would be to engage with KCBA to. Uh, to start to develop drawings and plans with the uh, help of district employees. Um, one set of plans for Glenside, one set of plans for Cedarbrook, which will take approximately 12 months, 12 to 15 months. And then once those plans are in place, then bid those plans out uh, and get the construction away, which would approximately take another 12 to 18 months. Okay. Okay. So, we'll be working through these for some time, which is understood. And to the earlier question from Mr. Epps, it's just 
uh, at the facilities committee meeting around the impact to the modulars and all that. I'm sure that'll all go into go into the decision making. A couple of years of work ahead of us. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Any other board questions, Ms. Love? This slide with the pathway and virtually with the with the um costs associated with each thing. The renovate the district office, 6.4 million. Does that mean renovating this building or building on at the high school? So renovating this building. This building. Okay. Um some of what KCB recommends is a little bit different than what the, so I'm just trying to reconcile what with what they're seeing here with what they have in here. And the the improve the HVAC improvements to the high school for 24 million, would that include a fire suppression system and new LED lighting? That's, that would not be part of it. Okay. The LED lighting is, is an in-house project. That's happening already, yeah. The, the fire alarm was replaced this. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure what they were. <laughs> Um, I guess the only sort of other comment I had about this was I understand all the moving pieces and, and I agree that I absolutely agree that Elvis Park just be done. Um, the addition on the Glen side, the one thing that I still am like just wondering about is parking there. Um, it, it's it's really tight already. Um, and then to add an additional like however many te more teachers and families and that kind of thing, I just I I assume that's gonna be taken into account when this all gets designed, but why? Yeah, so what I would say is that this is obviously this is conceptual, but you know, parking would have to be a consideration. Um, adding you know, what would be just a block of, of five classrooms for one for one grade. Um, so this proposal calls for that block of classrooms and then additional classrooms for any other programming that may have to be adjusted because not only would Martin have to be assessed at this building, but at all buildings because you would have to bring them back to each respective elementary school. That's a total of 14 classrooms. That's correct. At, at one side. Okay. My question is 14. Just that one side or 14 between the elements. Just the And is there how much would just the cost be to do the cost would be to just simply tear it? I mean, there's gotta be a cost issue, but also tearing down EP. Is that a fairly minimal cost? In in the grand scheme of things, it's not you know part of setting, but, but it could be I would say today it could be around a million dollars, depending on what kind of materials inside it has to be made. Yeah. And admin, this this is the last of our priorities. Whereas if we have to pull from not doing whatever here to shift that somewhere else, this is where the adults are. So right, got it. I understand. To Mr. Epps' point, consideration of mods again could go a couple ways, and. It's just we're too premature right now to, to make that decision. It, it may have to be a holding place for fifth grade down the road. Okay. I'm not looking at uh, Epic as being a long term. It, it, it's to address an immediate need. Um, could Advent start going? You know, so we, we have the flexibility. Um, and then do we get rid of this potentially at some so we're, we're just trying to yeah. address the immediate right ep is an immediate changing the model is an immediate and and that's what we're that's that's the focus at this point in time yeah yeah absolutely it makes sense any other questions Ms. um no, I don't think so. I think that the other thing that, that which sounds like it's not on the table is that. Yeah, never mind. I don't questions. Never mind. Okay. Any other board questions? And Ms. Blitzing, we cannot see. I see Ms. Mulhern. 
Yes, thank you. Just quickly, not so much a question as just a comment of uh, appreciation that we are at this place. It's, you know, we've been working well, I say we, uh, you all, administration and um, KCBA and all of, you know, everyone has been working on this for a long time with all of the input that we've had over the past year. So I just want to say thank you that we're, we're, you know, we're at a point now where we can actually, we have the information in front of us where we can receive a recommendation and make a plan to, to move forward because Dr. Scriven, as you just said, we have some very immediate needs that they're not going away. And the sooner we can make a smart, informed decision, uh, the better it is. So I am excited to see us moving forward. And uh, without making light of uh, what a serious decision it is, it's a lot of money. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big change to our current debt service. So uh, just appreciation. Thank you and excitement going forward. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Mulhern. All right. Um, seeing no other board comments or Mr. Verdelli? One more, uh, just a follow-up question, just in terms of the overall debt service. Uh, I know on the slide it was like 34 million. Uh, just the expectations around the, the timing of that debt service, is that a, that's a 20 year? So when you're in the design phase of a project, um, you're you're expending your soft costs, which are roughly five to 10% of the project. So you know, in the first 15, 12 months, you don't have a lot of capital expenditures. You have very minimal out the door. And then when you know once you bid a project, that's when you get large lump sum contracts and that's when you're buying steel or you're buying materials to, to build a project. So that's when you start to see those big um, big numbers start to go out the door for payment. So if you're talking about a debt service that you're talking about in a 15 month design period, then you're talking probably another six to eight months before you start talking about debt issues and building that project. And just for, for, for purposes of, you know, just my favorite slide with the annual debt service, the histogram uh, bar chart there. Um, just the, so the, the, the new debt would, also it goes to 46. So it's about about 20 years payback on it. I just wanted to clarify that. I didn't see 47 over there in the small corner before. Yeah, this, I mean, this is all hypothetical. So yep. I just picked a debt term. Um, I work with our bond agents to develop an amortization schedule, a repayment schedule based on the you know, current rates, which were high at the time. So um, that helps keep it conservative. Um, so the, the details don't be worth it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bernal Williams. I, I have a clarifying question related to the yeah, so what we were just talking through. So that's 37 billion debt obligation, does that include interest or is that just the amount of the 75 million that we'd be paying that debt? That is just, that is not interest. That's the cap, that's the principal. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, and then also likewise, since interest rates are still high, the soft cost, which is five to 10%, would probably not be through debt service, we would be trying to get as good a rate as Odds are that right direction. But okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to just clarify for myself and also I think members of the public what we're looking at here. And when we're talking about decisions and debt service and do like dollars on the screen, um, at what point does expenditure get realized in the sense of approved by the board? This is a recommend a recommended plan or capital plan, but it's not that after the legislative meeting, suddenly we are going to authorize $75 million of expenditures. It's, it's we're authorizing this direction over time. Three, three years. Over three years. So use, use the stadium as an example. Thank you. PCBA was approved last year, last spring. Um, so they began the development in the soft cost of that project, which is roughly um, a $10 million project. Their fee is roughly $400,000 um, for their design work over the past year. We've made them $160,000 roughly out of that $10 million. And we're already at one million. So yeah, the soft costs up front are, are much lower. When we bid the project and we get the actual numbers back, and say we need a million dollars for the stadium and we need um, another 1.1 stance, which is making numbers up. Not sure. Um, 
you bid that project as public approval by the board. And once the project is started, the project period is you know, six months, then it is for $5 million and you can file the cost after six months. So that's the bigger number. That's that's the timing of the cash flows. And likewise, for the, the details of the implementation, that's the this is almost, I mean, there's a lot of work to get to this point, but in some ways, the the real work of making sure programmatically things are going for good. What will pro programming look like in a new K K five model, et cetera? That's not finalized at this point because we wanted to get to the point of having a recommendation. And I'm, part of why I'm saying this is a to say, to say it out loud, make sure it's on the table, so nobody's walking away from this thinking every decision's been made, every possible question has been answered. It's it's this is a very solid approach that is being recommended based on a year's worth of community conversation, conversations with our staff and administration and board input. But this is actually in some ways the starting line for the actual projects themselves. This is a this is a process to help us determine where we're going to put our test That's pieces. Right. So that you don't hire Josh Swagger in a month and he says we need to close this school. We need to right. This is a, a way of receiving feedback um, from our you know, public survey, a way of presenting it to the public over the course of more than a year, um, try to do as best as we can. So thank you, and thank you again for all of the immense amount of work that you did. Great. Um, that is the end of board questions and comments. Is there any from the public? Oh, what yeah. have you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that was Giselle, uh, living in Glenside. The renovations to uh, Steve Brook and Glenside. Are we assuming that that work is going to be done and the kids are going to be able to go to school, or are we um, in that amount of money uh, possibly have relocation? Or what is the? So we still have Elkins Park School, and I think in the best case scenario, we complete that work um, outside of school and with as little impact to students as possible. And then when those spaces are ready to open, then we move those students on a clean cutoff of a semester or school year and then close up this one. So you would hope to be able to do one side between June and August, build that whole section. It won't happen that quickly, but okay. Yeah, so yeah. you would have to be working on it while they're in school, right? So are they going to be in school during the construction, or would you relocate one side students somewhere else while that construction? So the hope is for them not to be in school. That's why they would be doing the work after hours. But they okay, would but still physically here. be in that building. Gotcha. Okay. All that construction is okay. Any other questions? And yeah. and and just just to add on that, um, it's very possible that the work can happen while they are yeah, still I, in school. I just want so, to know what the money. If yeah, had no, I'm, I'm right. processing because a lot of experience in this where, um. We have to see what's in the best interest of not impacting the instructional program, but I don't want to put myself in a box <laughs> in terms of saying so it, could be, it, it, it could be odd. But you have no plans of moving the kids. No. Okay. Uh, Dana Kirkman, um, so for the updates that were listed on it, were they listed in any order of priority or were they just? They're just listed. Oh, okay. So the, the stadium project has already started. Um, the district office uh, is last, um, but they're just listed. Okay. Any any other questions? A couple of questions. Yes. In the each Shelton Man. Um, my first question is, uh, and it's it's basically pertaining to what Nava said. Um, we know we have to put something on the right side, but are we touching any of the other schools? My son went to CES. So I think they pretty much have the room right now. So no disruption, not even disruption, but is there anything that's going to happen to those other schools? Um, just You're just going to just put them in and that's it, right? So no. <laughs> okay. You, you can answer, but I mean, possibly, yes, there's additional renovations that may have to happen. To the others. Yeah, but not 
to this level. To go in five levels. Right. Okay. So this is my first question. I would just say classrooms have to be classrooms. So they have to be changed, they have to be changed. My section, my second question um was regarding the new, I'm gonna call it um non-traditional way of learning um program that is in the modules at EP. Is how many modules? You say non-traditional. Like, well, I was right, going back to, to the yeah. email. Oh, I did a little know, bit too. The, the non-traditional, they can't, they're not learning the traditional way or there's certain needs for them. So I'm not sure if you remember the name of the Epic. Epic. Okay. Yes. The Epic program located at EP down on that campus. Um I saw the modules, I saw like some cleaning stuff going on when I was driving by. Because of this action with EP, I know it's not connected. Will that still remain? Will Epic still remain on that campus? Yeah, as of now, yes. As of now. Okay. It, it's no need. Um First of all, that's a couple of years out, and that's why I preference by. by that was seven. my third question. What yeah. was the the ending? Like, when was this completion of Atwood Two? That was my third question. Three years, <laughs> roughly, roughly three years. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, and was that the final agenda item? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, so I think we can go to the next one. So just the last thing I wanted to discuss, um, as part of the American Rescue Plan and the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund money has to be received. Um, there's a required um, element to discuss in a public forum how the spending was uh, or what there's an interest in. So we did it. Uh, before the spending was made, um, when the budget was was adopted, and we've touched on this a couple times in the past two years. So now that this grant is coming to a close on September 30th, and the $4.3 million investment that we got from the government um, to address a variety of things, um, learning loss, after-school programs, summer school programs, compensatory education, um, we're now reaching the end of that grant period. And through 2023, 2024, we have spent the vast majority of that money, um, and we now only have a small balance, $187 left that's already been encumbered and um, set aside and contracted with for the delivery of technology within the first um, couple months of this year, which is why it's not a 23, 24 expense, because we're still awaiting receipt of delivery. So just some of the spending highlights, um, we invested um, significantly in smart boards for our classrooms. Um, to provide interaction at home and in the classroom to provide a more uh, productive learning environment for students. Uh, we also invested heavily in uh, Chromebooks for our students uh, for the same pur purpose that started out as an investment um, so that our students could access learning at home and evolved into a, a, you know, the, uh, a greater tool for our students so they could continue to learn and access our, our programs and increase our access to their classrooms and their families at home. Um, other spending highlights include uh, credit recovery, whether it be uh, credit recovery contracted through the Montgomery County Intermediary Unit or credit recovery pro programs and tutoring done within the schools, um, including after school tutoring, tutoring programs, and summer school programs, um, also a requirement, and that's a requirement as well as a much smaller piece of the money. Um, we're also a requirement of investor. And we invested heavily in math and reading materials to help deal with learning loss as a result of COVID-13. And I don't think that any of that learning loss, um, I don't think all of that learning loss has been eradicated, uh, which is why we still have programs like EPIC and we still have other tutoring programs that are still in existence, but uh, the funding provided by the federal government is um, coming to an end. So hence this slide. So any questions on this or three spending? Um, I'll start with the board, any more questions? Absolutely. Dana Burnley, you show you. Question about um, the ESSER three. Um, because these things are coming to an end, funding, 
is there any way, because a lot of those things were vital for some of the students, right? Um, is there a way to shift funds so we, we can still make an impact and we can still have so, so several things, or is it just the moment? So a lot of things we bought, we're trying to buy things that we that were investments into the future. So a lot of these technology purchases, um, obviously the smart boards are going to be in classrooms for a multitude of years and the Chromebooks are going to be in classrooms for multiple years. So we're trying to invest in things that um, would last beyond the end of the grant. And um, while we're already buying Chromebooks for our students before ESSER, this helped expedite that process greatly and fill that gap and um, replace a lot of them sooner. So we didn't really want to uh, lock ourselves into funding an extensive amount of programming that had to continue without any any funding stream to support it. So that that was where that was why the decision was made for a lot of it. But the educational part. So I know you mentioned like tutoring and things like that. Will that you know I know there's way so in the high school right if a child needs tutoring they can go to the honor society and get that tutoring there yeah, but for the other educational i mean the chromebook is educational but are there other things coming down the pike where we're missing out from this so no we, we, we still have tutoring that's just built into the budget so, oh. so they're going to we're going to institute a, a study hall also um there, there's multiple things that we need to do to address the gaps in terms of making sure that our athletes are student athletes. So um, this is not only student. I'm not even talking about athletes. <laughs> it's no, just for the. But I'm I'm just saying that a, a, a lot of emphasis on is on the fact that we have multiple students who are not eligible. Um, it also impacts them in terms of trying to um, transition and and meet the clearinghouse criteria for college. And it's just, I know that that's an area, not an assumption because you're parents of that, mm -hmm. but it is something that needs to be addressed. Um, when I talk about students, it's always all. Um, so you can make that one assumption about statements around student outcomes. So the reason I called out tutoring at summer school is because it's a required component. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, if you look at the funding out of the 4.3 million, it was 43,000. And it was 218,000. Obviously, in a, in a district as ours with a $130 million budget, those programs can be absorbed and are and are and still exist. Uh, just to piggyback off what Dan was saying, do you foresee um, the credit recovery? Because I know this, you know, this some school. Do you foresee it ever being false to the parents? No. Or will it still be? No. Yes. Now, this is L, Glenside. The interactive smart boards for the online school, you had to replace them. I'm assuming they were all new when we built the building, but is that what it was? You had to replace them. So, you know, Chromebooks, for example, they have a four year lifespan before they become obsolete, and smart boards are the same. Uh, four years? Five, five, to seven year. five to seven years. So, in five years, we have to replace them again. Um, what about the high school? Are those. That's been done already. Are they new or are we up to two? No, they're they're that new. Was, we just did that last year. Last, summer. last summer's that's response. Okay. Uh, no other comments or questions. <laughs> this was the last agenda item, correct? <laughs> no. Yes, <it> was. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I looked that one up. Um, so yeah, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mr. Bedell Williams, Mr. F. Second. All in favor? 